the that phrase, it is well with my soul, comes from a, a song a long time ago. A guy named Horatio Spafford wrote a hymn. And is the hymn titled, It is well with my soul? What's, is that the name of the hymn? Yeah. And so uh, you would think that Horatio Spafford would write that hymn after a lot of good things had happened in his life, right? <laughs> he wrote the hymn in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on an ocean liner on his way from from our East Coast over to to uh, Britain, I think is where he was headed. And uh, on the ocean liner, this was back in the days when he didn't have planes and, and those sorts of things, um, he crossed a place in the sea where his daughters had drowned about a month before. His wife had made the passage before he went from Chicago over. And it was in the days of telegraph, and he got a telegraph back that said, saved alone, all is lost from his wife. When he came to that same place in the ocean, he penned the words to that song, it is well with my soul. That's pretty amazing, right? I don't know if I could have done that. I hope I come to a place in my life where I could do that. I don't know that I'm there yet. Because, you know, what What I believe is this. A.W. Tozer said that, that what we believe about God is the most important thing about us. Think about that. What you believe about God, what you think about God, is the most important thing about you. Now, why is this true? Why is it true that what we believe about God is the most important thing about us? What, what would make that so? It predicts how you'll respond when you face a crisis. It predicts how you'll respond when life doesn't go your way. It predicts how you respond when life does go your way. It predicts who you'll lean on, who you'll trust, or who you won't trust. It predicts a whole lot about you. I can really know a lot about how you're going to respond to a situation in your life when I know what you think about God. It's important that our thinking about God be clear and true and right so that we can respond well. That's why we're doing this series called Disappointment with God. Because I know that we all have moments in life when we're disappointed, when things haven't gone our way, when, when friends have let us down, when, when the bottom has fallen out of our life somehow, when we have health challenges, when we lose a friend, when there's a tragic car accident, when cancer enters the scene. There's all kinds of things that can make us feel disappointed in God. So how we see God in the middle of our disappointment determines how we'll arrive at the other side. Will we get to the other shore with a faith that can stand the journey? My hope for you as your pastor is to help you come to a place where you, what you think about God is really who God really is. Based on what Jesus has taught us in the Bible, in the scriptures, what ancient writers of the story of God have told us that we can take to the bank so that you can have a trust that can stand the test of your life. Because you will be tested in this life, I promise. You know, sometimes we come to moments when you face amazing tests. Right now around the world, uh, we're having these volcanoes happen everywhere. You notice this? Out in Hawaii, there's volcanoes going off. Guatemala, volcanoes going off. Crazy, right? And people fleeing for their lives and doing all that. Well, this has been going on for thousands and thousands of years since the beginning of creation. There have been volcanoes. Um, back on May 30th, near the city of Pompeii in Italy, there was uh, an excavation going on. They, they unearthed this picture. <laughs> this, and they titled it, The Unluckiest Man in the World. <laughs> this cat apparently was trying to flee from the volcano um, called Vesuvius that was near Pompeii. And as he was trying to get through the streets of the city, this giant stone, they think it was like a doorstep. That's a pretty impressive doorstep. Um, fell and, cru and crushed his head while he's trying to run through the streets. That's a pretty unlucky cat, right? How many of you guys think he's unlucky? Now, <laughs> others are saying, I don't know. Um, the, the, uh, anyway, that's a pretty impressive picture. Pretty good reminder that there are unlucky people all the time, and there are people that can be really mad about God, about a lot of things. And this, this guy was probably having a pretty decent day until the volcano decides to erupt, and then the whole city breaks into chaos, and he's just trying to get out of there. He's making his way through the streets, and bam, here you go, the unluckiest man in the world. Now, here's what I know. Some of you came in today, and you feel a lot like that. You're thinking... I am 
the unluckiest person in the world. I am the most miserable human on the planet. I've had more challenges, more things go wrong. I had a good friend one time who did have a lot of challenges, and in a lot of ways her life felt to me like this picture looks, like, Lord have mercy, everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. And she said to me on the phone one day, she said, I think God hates me. You ever felt that way? I think God hates me. I think he's just trying to do me in. I, I am the unluckiest person in the world. And if I went through the room and I, and I talked to you, different ones, you've had all kinds of things happen recently, you would have reasons to feel like you were mighty unlucky and that, that life just wasn't going your way. And so um, it's important to look into the life of someone who maybe truly was maybe the unluckiest person in the world, a guy named Job. And um, it is found in our Old Testament part of our Bibles. It's perhaps the oldest story in the Bible. When you open your Bible, you would think it would, it would go from chron in a chronological order. It doesn't necessarily. The oldest written record we have is probably the story of Job. Interestingly, it's a story about a man who suffered a whole lot, who was incredibly unlucky, incredibly challenged, incredibly tested. So I want to take you into the story of Job for a minute. I'm going to try to give you the overarching story of Job. It's over 40 chapters long, so obviously I'm not going to preach the whole thing today. And so I'm going to try to give you the high-level overview of Job's life and of what's going on in the backstory of Job. Because there's a basic outline to the story of Job, and it goes something like this. Well, as a matter of fact, I'll pick up the very first chapter and read the beginning of it. This will help you. Oh, and by the way, I need to say this. Mike mentioned it earlier, but some of you weren't here at the announcements. Um, today's worship, very important that if you need to move for whatever reason, potty break, whatever, I would say do it now, right now. And be back in here within two minutes. So if you need to go, go. I'm serious. But if you, if you leave later that, don't come back. Go to the overflow right over here. Because it's not going to be safe for you. It's not going to be good for us. We need you to be in worship today. So if you're here and you're good, great. If you need to go, go now or forever. Hold it. And, uh, and we'll, we'll come to it later. So trust me, this is best for all of us. And anyway, so anyway, here's the story of Job. There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of perfect integrity. Okay, say those words with me. Perfect integrity. Perfect integrity. Job was a man of perfect integrity. Hang on to this. Who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons, three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. This is an amazing man. This is a man of God who had perfect integrity. All right, get this. Scriptures are telling us he has perfect integrity. Then we skip down, verse 6. You need to see the backstory and what's about to go on in Job's life. One day, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. They came to present themselves before the Lord, and then Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity. There's those words again, perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. So what do you know about Job so far? What kind of man is he? Good man or bad man? Good man, perfect integrity. Even God says perfect integrity. This is a good man, really good man. So this is the backstory. The book of Job is going to give us a two or three chapter prelude to the story. So you know things about what's going to happen before they happen. It's like you've watched the movie in advance. And now you go to the movie and you know, oh, this is what's going to happen. Well, here's what's going on. So he's got perfect integrity. We know this. God is bragging to Satan about this. Now, this is troubling to me. This is interesting to me. This is different to me. I don't think about God and Satan having conversations. But apparently, it happens. Apparently, there's something going on. 
apparently there's something outside of our view, outside of what we can see and touch and taste in a different dimension where there's a spiritual world, a cosmic world that's looking in on our world. Hang on to that. This is important. There's a cosmic world outside of this one looking in on you, looking in on me, looking in on Job and seeing how we're going to handle our lives. Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household and everything he owns? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord answered back, very well. Everything he owns is in your power. However, you must not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. One day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house because they got together and had feasts every night, all these brothers and sisters, they loved to hang out and be together. A messenger came to Job and reported while the oxen were plowing and the donkeys grazing nearby, the Sabians swooped down and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported that a lightning storm struck from heaven. It burned up the sheep and the servants and devoured them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. The messenger was still speaking. When another came and reported, the Chaldeans formed three bands, made a raid on the camels, and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on the young people so that they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up, tore his robe and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshiped, saying, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of Yahweh. Throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. But there's more. See, he lost his whole family in a day. He lost his whole family. Can you imagine? He lost everything. And yet he's saying, I'm not going to blame God. He, he, he maintained his integrity. One day the sons of God came again to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it, same answer. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity. Hold on. What just happened to Job? What did he lose? everything and then God is saying the same thing about him as he said in chapter one have you considered this man he's a man, there's no one else on earth like him he's a man of perfect integrity he's got this integrity he's sticking to it he's not giving up there's no one else that fears God and turns away from evil he still retains his integrity even though you incited me against him to destroy him without just cause skin for skin Satan answered a man will give up everything he owns in exchange for his life, but stretch out your, your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan isn't done. And this is disturbing, but God takes him up. So, all right, let's see. Let's see. Very well, the Lord told Satan. He is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence and affected Job with terrible boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself while he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Job replied, you speak as a foolish woman speaks. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. pretty amazing you see something cosmic is going on something bigger than we can see is going on so it's important that we understand what's happening and we look behind this and as we look into the story of Job 
then we can begin to understand. You see, his wife's deal was, hey, <laughs> you just need to curse God and die because this is awful. You look awful. Everything's been taken away from us. There is no more. So curse God and die. And let me tell you, friends, you might be saying that to yourself. I should just curse God and die. This is just not worth it. You may have friends telling you that and people you love telling you, man, this is just too much. You should just give up. Just cash it in. Because apparently God hates you. Does God hate Job? Yes or no? Does God hate Job? Yes or no? When you equate things that happen in your life to God's love or care or not love or care, then you're probably messing up. Matter of fact, the book of Job goes on. And so you've heard from Job's wife. And now now Job's friends step into the frame. And they begin to tell Job their theories about God. For a while, for seven days, they come and sit with Job and they're just quiet. This is really good. When you have a friend that's suffering, the best thing you can do is just go be with them and then shut up. You don't know anything about God. I don't know anything about God. God is bigger than we are. Stop trying to explain God and why things happen to people. Because we really don't know. Did Job or his family, any of them see what had gone on in the heavens between God and Satan? Did any of them know about that? No. So how could you possibly begin to explain what's going on in Job's life if you don't know that? How can you begin to possibly see how things are really going if you don't know that? Because because we have this framework outside of the story. Job's friends, their basic storyline went something like this. They basically said, listen, um, we know that that you have been bad. You've done something wrong, Job, because God has this, this way of working in the world. And the way he works in the world is this, that if you do good things, then you get good things. And if you do bad things, then you get bad things. Now, that theory, this is a theory most of us pack in, by the way. This is what the theory you came in with, most likely. Part of why you came to worship today is a personal wager with God that if I do the right things, I show up at worship, that I'm going to get all good things in my life. But history and experience, personal stories, tell you that's not necessarily true. Because remember what God said about Job. He's a man of perfect integrity. He's a man that fears me. Something about Job's response mattered to God. It mattered in the heavens. It matters in the cosmos. How would Job respond to this crushing test he was given? What would he do? Somehow, God was very interested in Job's response. Job's very interested. I mean, God is very interested in your response, too. How will you respond when times of testing come? When hard times come, will you believe the lie that only good things happen to good people and only bad things happen to bad people? You see, Job's friends spent chapters and chapters of the book of Job trying to convince him that he had been bad, he had done something wrong. But he hadn't done anything wrong. We know this. I think Job's test came because God seeks people whose hearts are fully his. Who will love him and trust him even when the test comes. Who will not give up on him even when it doesn't make sense. God's looking for people that have have that kind of heart. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says this, that the eyes of the Lord look out all over the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully his. I got to ask you, is your heart fully God's? Do you trust God no matter what? You can. You can trust him no matter what. 
Job has three friends who totally mess up theology. They get, they're thinking about God is all wrong. And it tests Job severely to hear from them because they're yakety, 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 yakety. They're so full of confidence, so full of, of assuredness that they're right. And just trying to get Job to admit that he's been a bad person and that's why this has happened. And then they say, and if you'll just admit that, then God will, this will all go away. It's not true. You see, Job's response mattered in the heavens and the cosmos and yours does too. Mine does too. How we respond tells us what we believe about God. You see, maybe Job's test came because, because God desires an uncoerced faith, an uncoerced trust, an uncoerced love for him more than anything. Maybe what God values most in, in you and me is our trust and faith and love of him. That's what he seeks. That's what he looks for. Some of you are Christ followers, and this is news you need to hear. This is what Jesus is calling you into. is a deep, abiding fidelity and trust in God. That you don't break under pressure. That you don't cut and run. But you maintain a faith in God no matter what's happening in life. This is the kind of faith that we're called into as Jesus followers. Some of you will use a message like today's to turn away from God. You'll say, well, if that's how God is, then I'm just taking my ball and going elsewhere. And you can. But let me ask you a question. Where are you going? You got a system that's better? You got an idea that's better? You could choose atheism. There is no God. You could choose that. But let me just tell you, let me be honest. I've seen too many people near the ends of their life you're going to have to have a whole lot of faith to maintain a faith that there is no God. To maintain that, that view on a deathbed when you're facing the unknown and eternity and to maintain a position there is no God because I don't like how he runs the universe. Well, just by saying you don't like how he runs the universe, you're admitting there is a God. So what are you going to do? How will it be for you? Will you trust him? Job was put to the severe test. His friends tried to explain it was because he had been bad. He wasn't bad. Job's being tested because God wants to see, is he truly mine? Does he truly trust me? You may face some, te some tests in your life. Sad to say, because God wants to see, will you trust him? Will you love him? Will you believe in him even when it's the darkest? These tests of faith bring us to dark places in our lives, places where we feel like God's not there, there's no light. And as I studied for this, it made me think of the old-timey 35-millimeter cameras. You guys remember these? And, and, the, the, and you, would, you would load it up with film. You remember getting those little film canisters? Usually they were yellow, and you'd take that film, and you would, like, run it across a spindle. Then you would crank it up a little bit. Then you would take your pictures. But then it wasn't like today where it's like, oh, you can see your picture right away. This is, like, so old school. You guys can't even believe it's happened. I'm even talking about it. But you're like, you, would take the, you would roll the, can the film back into the canister. Then what would you do with it? You take it somewhere to be developed. Guess what they had to do to develop the film? They had to take it into a dark room to be developed. Our faith often requires a dark room, a place to be developed. That's hard. This is hard news for me to give to you. But if you don't know how life really works... And what God is up to sometimes, you are going to be so brokenhearted, so upset with God so many times. It's going to, you're going to struggle in ways that are just unbelievable. The dark room isn't to crush you. The dark room is to develop you. It's to develop you, to bring out all the colors of your life, to bring out all your faith. I can tell you. From those who I've seen go through the dark rooms of life, 
and maintain their integrity and hang on to their integrity in God, what comes out the other side is magnificent. The most abundantly beautiful lives you've ever seen. So the test isn't to crush you. The test is to develop you. The test is to bring you to a place where you can, you can trust God in the middle of anything. Now, there were the first three friends that came. Then there was a, a friend named Elihu who comes to Job and he begins to talk to Job. And, and Elihu's basic, basic train of reasoning is this. Job, you're not perfect. You're just not perfect. I know you're really good, but you're just not perfect. And he says, but, but God is perfect. He said, you need to maintain your integrity, basically. And Elihu gets it kind of right. Job, he wasn't, he, he wasn't as bombastic as the other friends and, and just impressing it on the wrong frame. But he was sure to make, make sure that Job kind of was beginning to lean back into God and to trust God again. Far away from Job's wife's response of curse God and die, God, Elihu's deal was basically a call to worship, call to come back to God. See, when you're at wit's end, worship's the right answer. When you can't figure it out, worship's the right answer. And that's kind of where it goes. The best way to sum up Elihu's speech, I thought, was to bring it from a New Testament perspective. And First Peter 16, or First Peter 1, 6 and 7 says this. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes, perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. You see... These tests, these dark rooms, these places we go to are to develop our faith. that will make us more faithful, more connected to God, more loved by God. Not less loved by God. Not judged by God. Not left alone by God. But this is what I know too. In our disappointment, our disappointment can slide into bitterness. And that bitterness can slide into a hardness of heart. And it can push us into a place where we just, not only do we not trust him, but we hate him. Job had listened to all his friends. He had gone through all this stuff. And he had just kind of had it. In Job 31, it picks up Job's frustration with God and with his friends. And in Job 31, Job asked for an audience with God. Job asks, he said, he goes through kind of a litany of stuff and he says, listen, I've been righteous. I've not done anything wrong. And I don't know why God isn't hearing me. I don't know why I'm in this dark place. I don't understand it because I have had integrity. Was that true? Yes or no? Yes, the Bible has given us the frame ahead of time. We see what's going on behind the scenes. Yes, he was right. Yes, he was right. I'll jump to the end of the story for just a moment. Job does get an answer from God. And before Job answered, part of the answer to, to Job was God addresses Job's friends. And he says to them, I'm so angry with you. I'm so put out with you. I'm so sick of you. What you've said about me is not true. You have lied about me. Therefore, he gives him a list of things to do, and he said, and I'll have Job pray for you, and then I might forgive you. Be careful how you try to explain God. Because the people get blasted in this one are Job's friends who thought they were representing God. 
So Job cries out, and in Job 31, 35, he says this, If only I had someone to hear my case. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my opponent oppose and compose his indictment. Come on, God. Bring it. I'm sick and tired of what you've done. I'm done with you. It's time for a little courtroom action, God. And Judge Job is in the house. I don't know if you've ever been to courtroom, but man, there comes a moment in the courtroom when the judge is coming in and he calls the court to order. When that judge comes in, the bailiff says, all rise. So for just a moment, I want all of you to rise. All of you rise. This is for all of us who've ever wanted an answer from God. This is for all of us who've called for an audience with God when we feel like our case has not been heard. This is not only Job versus God. This is the people versus God. So today, I'm going to let you stand beside Job. And I want you to hear God's response to Job. When Job calls for an audience with God, he finally gets one. You can stay standing as long as you can answer God's questions for Job. When you can no longer answer God's questions for Job, you might want to be seated. So friends, here is God's reply to all of us who've ever wanted to judge God. Who is this that obscures my plans with words and without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it, and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come, and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning, or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges, and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light, and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed, or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain, and a path for the thunderstorm? To water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate wasteland, and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father, who fathers the drops of dew, from whose womb? comes the ice, who gives birth to the frost from the heavens, when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, can you loosen Orion's belt, can you break forth the constellations in their seasons, or lead out the bear with its cubs? 
You know the laws of the heavens. Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who gives the Ibis wisdom? Or gets the rooster understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness? And satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in the thicket. Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her form? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they get from you? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. Who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord. I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Will you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can your voice thunder like His? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash your fury and your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have heard you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I see the works of your hands and Galaxies spin in a heavenly dance Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming I hear the sound of your voice all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise oh God all that you are is so overwhelming I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. And God, I run into your arms, unashamed. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. You know, I know that many of us come to a place where we feel 
Like maybe we're the unluckiest people in the world. It leaves us with lots of questions. Ask your questions, but maintain your integrity. It leaves us in a place where we could become bitter, but please don't become bitter. Please return to worship. When you're at wit's end and you don't know what's going on, return to worship. There is more. Your response to God matters to God more than you know. He's looking for those whose hearts are completely his. He wants to step into your life. He wants to strengthen you and encourage you and bring you through. At the end of the story of Job, Job has twice as much as he had before. Everything was restored. His future was better than his past had been. But he maintained integrity. He didn't give up on God. And I don't want you to give up on God either. And today, I hope, if you've been tempted to be the judge of God, that maybe today you would hang up your judge's robe and you would just worship, that you, we could return to worshiping God and stop being God's judge. Would you pray with me? Father, help us now to shift from being judges of you, people who proclaim to know all things, to understand our real place in the universe and our real place as those who are created and not as the creator. To know that you know things we couldn't even imagine. We couldn't handle all that you might want to say to us. We, we couldn't hold it in our minds. So God, leave us in a place, help us to come to a place now where we choose to worship in spite of what we don't understand. For all who are at wit's end today, God, bring us back to worship. In Jesus' name.